Well, I want to keep us right on schedule, so I'm going to be very, very brief with you. I have been asked to say a little something about the principles, the statement of principles of Campaign for Liberty. If you go to campaignforliberty.com, you click on About, which nobody does, but you should. Click on About, gives a statement of principles, and you'll find there really is no other organization that quite is putting this forth the way Campaign for Liberty is in all these different areas. And we can distill the statement of principles into this little mission statement, which the mission statement reads as follows, to promote and defend the great American principles of individual liberty, constitutional government, sound money, free markets, and a non-interventionist foreign policy by means of educational and political activity. That's what the Campaign for Liberty is about. Parentheses, I wrote that actually. I was the guy, I wrote that. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Anytime, anytime you need one sentence written, you just give me a call, okay? I'm really good at that. As I say, it's very hard to find an organization that will stick to these principles and that will try to insert into the conversation something different. It won't just be another droning on about wasteful government spending. Like who, who isn't against wasteful government spending, for heaven's sake, right? I mean, we're all, right? But this Campaign for Liberty believes in something a little bit more substantial. It wants to revive the so-called old right of before World War II, when uh, conservatives, libertarians stood for things that actually mattered in the world. They weren't just competing with each other to see who could be uh, more of a drone or a plastic man, but who could really promote ideas that are the foundation of civilized life and of freedom. Now, I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to introduce to you a person who is frankly one of my favorite people in the world. And I think if I, of all the zillions of people I've gotten to know and had the, have had the good fortune of knowing in the brief number of years I've been involved in these circles, Dan is way, way up in the top 10 of people I know in terms of, of ability and knowledge and just overall class. It's very rare to come across somebody like Dan. Anything I'm involved in from now on, from now until I die, if I ever start an organization, I want Dan in a leadership role. He is far and away one of the most knowledgeable people I know. I'm always learning from this guy. I never feel like a meal with Dan is wasted. Not that every meal I have has to be dorky, but I'm guaranteed a good, nice, dorky meal when I'm sitting with Dan. <laughs> Uh, how good, the, some, some dorks in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, good. Dan uh, has a, a bachelor's degree, a double major in classics and history from Washington University in St. Louis. He spent a summer as a graduate fellow at the Mises Institute uh, with us some years ago. He was the, uh, the internet communications coordinator in the uh, 2008 Ron Paul presidential campaign, he ran the blog The Daily Dose, which was one of my favorite parts of the, the campaign. That was a great blog, and we all, some of us even got to know each other as commenters on that blog, and that was Dan. Dan is currently senior editor of the American Conservative magazine, which is a great magazine you all should read, amconmag.com. He is editorial director of Young American Revolution, which is the publication of Young Americans for Liberty. But above all, I would say that if, if you were to listen to a discussion of the history of the conservative movement, there's really no one you'd want to hear from more than Dan McCarthy. And I personally consider it to be an outrage that we are living in a society in which Dan McCarthy is not a household name. Let's change that, ladies and gentlemen. Dan McCarthy. <laughs> Well, Tom is, uh, as always, generous to a fault, and uh, I hope my remarks today will be of at least some use to you and will give you a sense that um, there really is a, a profound confusion about the nature of conservatism, and this confusion has been growing over the course of uh, many decades and became really acute in the past 10 years. And my remarks today in talking about the history of the conservative movement will try to alleviate some of the confusion and show why Ron Paul actually represents uh, the very best in conservatism as opposed to so many of the other uh, voices out there who claim to speak for the right, but who in fact uh, speak only for particular interests or for uh, the big banks or for any number of other forces that are actually leading this country into uh, great danger. 
Now, it would be very nice if we conservatives could say that uh, we're not responsible for the terrible things that are going wrong in this country right now. Uh, we, we find our country enmeshed uh, in a nation-building war in Iraq right now, which is, it's not a war being fought for our national interest. It's a war being fought uh, basically in order to uh, advance a very large ideological project to try to transform uh, what other people in the other parts of the world are doing. Uh, instead of being fought for defensive purposes, it's being fought for more imperial purposes. We, uh, of course, have an economy which is riddled with bailouts and with uh, federal intervention into the private sector. Increasingly, we're moving to a, a point where the government, uh, at least the rate in which government is employing people, is increasing relative to the rate at which um, the private sector is employing people. What that means is basically that as we're losing jobs in the private sector, whatever so-called uh, job growth we're seeing is actually taking place in the, pri in the, uh, the public sector, in, in government. Uh, and basically, if you're getting to a point where government uh, will soon be employing more people than the private sector, that's a pretty good definition of socialism, and that's certainly uh, a pretty frightening commentary on you know, where we're going as a nation. Uh, and of course, we've seen uh, you know, a sense of entitlement, a sense of uh, you know, government now has to control our health care, it has to control our retirement funds. Uh, this uh, you know, really very old form of uh, state control over all of our lives has been actually getting worse and worse. And certainly with Obamacare, we've seen a tremendous uh, expansion of the control of government over a vitally important sector of our lives. It would be nice if we conservatives could say that we you know, didn't have any responsibility for this if we were fighting it all along. But unfortunately, um, long before Obama came on the scene, we saw precursors of many of these things taking place under President Bush. Uh, of course, it was Bush who took us into Iraq in the first place. Uh, Bush introduced uh, an extraordinary amount of federal power in higher education, and actually at all levels of education, thanks to the um, uh, No Child Left Behind Act, which is uh, just a, t a terrible piece of legislation and something which you would have expected of a liberal, but of course, uh, Bush, who claimed to be a conservative, was the one who, who pushed that. Uh, we also saw, a, you know, up until Obamacare, what was before that, the largest expansion of the entitlement state uh, since Lyndon Johnson uh, took place under Bush. That was the prescription drug add-on to uh, Medicare. And um, the first round of bailouts also was not a product of, you know, the new Ad Obama administration. It actually began with Bush and with uh, Henry Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury that Bush had picked, who in fact was a former Goldman Sachs uh, executive. So it looks a lot as if, you know, Bush and Obama, there's a great deal of continuity. And, you know, it's, it's easy enough for us to say, and it's quite true, that Bush was never a real conservative. Uh, people were saying that even back in 2000. Certainly those of us who were supporting Pat Buchanan in 1999 and 2000 knew that Bush was uh, an imitator, a fake. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people who are conservatives did vote for Bush. They did that in 2000, and they did it in 2004. And there's something that has to be explained here, which is how good conservative people can wind up voting for a candidate who, in fact, imposes policies that are every bit as bad as Barack Obama's. Uh, and if they look a little bit less bad, it's just because they got started a little earlier, and we've seen things get kind of progressively worse as we've lived with the consequences of more state intervention in the economy and, and in our lives. The, the uh, confusion about the nature of conservatism has really badly impacted uh, the next generation. One of the reasons why so many young people voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and now consider themselves to be liberals is because throughout their lives, they're, you know, if they're under 20 years old uh, or you know, even younger, they've only lived under uh, a situation in which conservatism has been identified with George W. Bush and with various forms of imperialism, of big government at home, and things that are really inimical, actually, to the true essence of conservatism. Uh, that's why so many young people today uh, misidentify themselves and think of themselves as liberals. It's because they're reacting against a fake idea of what conservatism is. And that's why we've also seen that the really, you know, the smartest young people, those who have looked most carefully at the issues, uh, actually support Ron Paul because they recognize that there is... There, there really is an alternative to uh, the disasters that George W. Bush led us into, and those, that alternative is not Barack Obama. Real change means Ron Paul. Real change means the conservatism that we never had under Bush and that uh, Ron Paul, in fact, uh, can give us.